Hey everyone and welcome to my Jhana guide. I've been very excited to make this guide as Jhana has been S tier for quite a while now with a very fun and surprisingly diverse playstyle. This is going to be a long video like my guides usually. There are going to be timestamps in the description below to help you navigate around the video. Without further ado, let's jump into it. Let's start with Jana's identity. She is the strongest enchanter ever since uh, the patch 12.14 with a buff to Rift Herald and Dragon um, due to her mobility so she can get around to these neutral objectives better than any other enchanters. Jana has been one of the strongest enchanters for a long time as well and Jana is also the most mobile enchanter and her builds will reflect that later. Although not necessary uh, in order to pick her, she is a great counterpick to a lot of engage tools with her Q and her R. She's probably the best disengage enchanter. She's also one of the two enchanters that has disengage in pre-6 laning phase, the other being Renata, which means that she can play aggressively in lane versus engagers. Lastly, Janna can be played as a scaling enchanter, a roaming enchanter, a lane dominant enchanter, depending on comps. Moving on to her place in drafts. So given that Janna has so many playstyles, she can be picked in almost every situation. And for me, this is important for a champ to be S tier, to be really flexible in draft, and to be able to be blind picked. She can be picked with hyper carries like Twitch, Jinx, Aphelios, etc. To, to keep them safe and to scale alongside them. Or she can be picked against hard engage, typically from the support and jungle roles for champs such as, you know, Zac, Fiddle, Alistair, Rel to disengage. Or she can be picked with a proactive uh, or early pressuring mid-jungle duo so that you can roam to them and help snowball those win conditions. The only time I think it's bad on paper to pick Janna in my eyes is when you verse an enchanter that scales harder, like uh, Lulu or Yumi, you know, or Sona or Zillion, and your mid-jungle is low pressure or scaling as well, then you can't really pressure through bot or through the mid-jungle. But for the most part, she is a fantastic pick and can be blinded. All right, let's talk about lane synergies. So any ADC that is not dependent on all-in, so uh, as long as you're not playing the Kaisis, Samira, Callista, Tristana, every other ADC has synergy with Janna. A couple worthy mentions. Israel um, is self-sufficient to allow her to perma roam. Kate is really strong in lane so that you can perma shove while Janna keeps her safe in lane. But Janna's uh, lane strength will mostly come from her support matchup if she can pressure in that role. Speaking of the enemy support pick, we're going to be talking about lane counters now. So we'll start with what Janna counters, and she counters any engaged champ that commits forward and struggles to retreat. This is going to be Alistair, Leona, Rel, those are the most common ones that come to mind. Um, Nort and Rakan, to some extent, are answered, but they are less committal, so you can't heavy trade on them on exit. Um, and in Nort especially, it can be hard to interrupt their burst because he still brings you forward. Um, Janna, she's also great against, you know, Wardens, a class I never really talk about, but these are Braum, Tarek, Tarm, where she can dominate and prevent any attempts uh, at all in because they have pretty poor all-in attempts. I'll also mention low-range ADCs, which are easy to hit with her Q, such as Draven and Samira. All right, moving on to what Janna is counted by, and this is going to be a pretty long list in the laning phase. She's counted by pretty much every ranged support. Um, enchanters who are going to have more lane presence and potentially more scaling. Mages who are just going to be able to absolutely dominate the lane where she can't really use her abilities very effectively. Um, she gives the enchanters a free lane like I said and she can't put up much of a fight versus these ranged lane bullies. The most common ones you'd see are like Senna, uh, Zyra, Brand, Misfortune maybe. She also struggles versus playmakers like Pike, Thresh, I'm even going to put Blitz in there as she can't disengage hooks. Okay, let's talk about runes now. So from my experience, Glacial Primary should be run almost 10 times out of 10. Comet, it scales too poorly. Airy, um, you can only make an argument for it when you're versus um, a Warden, and even then you can still win lane and scale better with Glacial. Her Q being able to land as an engage and a disengage tool gives so much value to Glacial. Um, okay, so you're taking the Glacial tree. Um, I mean, you're taking the inspiration tree, you want to take stopwatch 8 out of 10 times, unless you're planning on dominating bot 2v2 and never roaming in the early game. Then you can consider magical boots instead. Then the next branch, futures market 10 times out of 10. It's too valuable to be able to hit your mythic and your tier 2 boots spikes at faster times. And biscuits, pretty useless on Janna. Uh, I don't like that rune in general, but 
Janna, also, she's not really an ability spammer that is gated by mana to win lanes. It's more fishing for those keys from Fog and the lane matchup in general. And then in the last branch, Cosmic Insight, the typical choice for enchanters. The main variation for Janna runes comes in the secondary runes. So this depends on if you are playing for lane or if you're playing for roaming. If you're playing for lane, then um, verse engagers or lane matchups where you expect to contest for prio, you want to take resolve. So this is where you would take bone plating and revitalize versus the engagers because you want that bone plating to make sure that you survive. Or if you verse like range or enchanter lanes, you want to take font of life backed up with revitalize. It's also worth noting that uh, the glacial slow scales off your heal and shield power. So this has extra synergy with revitalize. Okay, so that's if you're playing for lane. If you're playing for roaming, when your lane is weaker or when you have a really volatile mid jungle duo and you really want to play through them instead, you want to take mobility rune secondary and this is either going to be celerity water walking or eyeball collection and relentless hunter eyeball and relentless they snowball a lot harder and opportunities to you know get kills and roam around are always abundant in solo queue but either can work celerity water walking they're effective immediately eyeball relentless you stack them up a bunch and then they're going to be more valuable so you can just choose between those two it could be personal preference but just i think it's important to distinguish if you are going to be playing for laning or for roaming Okay, so moving on to the shards now. Cooldown reduction, adaptive force and armor, practically 10 times out of 10, unless you need magic resist in lane. So Janna's strength, it's not from overwhelming with stats and with heavy trades, but instead having uptime for utility, scaling up and, like I said, countering uh, the matchup in lane rather than just poking and spamming a lot. So that's why you would want to take cooldown reduction for the extra uptime and scaling rather than the double adaptive force. You will see some Janas take like Aerial Comet backed up with the Domination Tree to take both Celerity, Water Walking, and Relentless Hunter. In my opinion, this is this is a suboptimal build. Your Keystone is practically wasted. Comet's not going to scale whatsoever. Aerie, you're not really going to get a lot of value out of that. I think that Glacial is just too good to give up. The main exception is if there is your Versa Warden and you just want to absolutely dominate them from minute one to win lane as hard as possible. Okay, moving on to items. So you want to take Spell Thieves as your starting item 10 times out of 10. If you're going to struggle to proc Spell Thieves in the 2v2 lane, you can roam and proc through those roams. For boots, it's between Lucidity and Swifties. Once again, if you're playing for lane or if you're playing to roam. Obviously Swifties for the roaming and then Lucidity for the laning and the scaling option. I strongly dislike Mobies on any champ and I would advise against taking this on Janna as well. So in terms of if you get boots or if you get mythic first, in my opinion, you either get boots first for roaming or you rush mythic for the laning. If you're going to stay in lane and dominate, you want lane stats instead. Okay, so speaking of mythic, Shirelia's 9 times out of 10, even 99 times out of 100. You would only consider Moonstone if you expect fights to be very extended, with both teams having a lot of melee frontline. Okay, so after the mythic and the boots, the situational items are next as always. Arden Sensor with two or more teammates who, want to, who benefit from on-hit and attack speed. Mikhail's if there are two or more reasons, including I would say at least one ult like Ash, Leona, Sedge, Seraphine ults um, to cleanse an ally. A non-ult reason could be, you know, like Thresh, Q, Zoe, Bubble, Ari, Charm, etc. Okay, and then Putrefire if there are two or more significant healing sources on the enemy team, such as Raka, Aatrox, Fiora, Silas, etc. These should be the main situational items. I've changed my mind a little bit on flowing water. I really don't see many situations where you should get that item. And I don't think it makes much sense for Janna as well, as she can't regularly proc them on the whole team. You would rather consider flowing water on champs like, you know, Karma, Seraphine, Sona, etc. Okay, so sometimes none of the above mentioned situational items will be necessary. And so the filler item is redemption. And as usual, Buy Wardstone as soon as you're level 13. I want to give a special mention to Magi's Rush, um, if the game permits. Or even Dark Seal, Complete Mythic, which is a huge spike for enchanters, and then you can fish, finish up the Magi's as well. Because Janna is great at staying alive and collecting those stacks. So, I just want to quickly recap how I see Janna's two main builds. If you're opting in for the laning identity, you want to take Glacial, Magical Boots, Revitalize, and Font of Life or Bone Plating, depending on the matchup. You rush Mythic, and then you get Lucidity Boots afterwards. This is something I haven't mentioned, but you want to take uh, Heal instead of Exhaust, because Exhaust is good for when you want to roam and impact, um, and Heal is better if you just want to scale up 
as your items and your revitalizers going to scale the heal. Um, and you also want to take Trinket so that you can ward for lane and dominate in the 2v2. For the roaming identity, you want to take Glacial, Stopwatch, Eyeball and Relentless ideally, and then Swifty's Rush, and then you go Mythic. And like I said, you take Exhaust to have more impactful roams, and then you take Sweeper as well so that you can stay in fog when you are roaming around. Okay, moving on to Janna's abilities. You want to max E, and then W, and then Q. You should start Q 10 times out of 10. I've experimented a little bit with W start, it felt very underwhelming. E start, there's just no reason that you should ever do that. Um, so start Q, and then you should take E for the most part, like nine times out of 10. Your E at level two allows you to auto attack Q, auto attack to proc all three spell thieves and to stay healthy while doing so. Sometimes you can W at level two in matchups where you can freely trade, especially wardens come to mind here. In terms of what her abilities do, I'm going to assume you know her abilities for the most part. I just want to mention that her E gives a passive where if she displaces an enemy with her Q or her ult, she gets extra healing and shielding. So you can use this bonus um, scaling for summon a heal if you're playing for lane, for her E or for her ult heal, of course. So you can see this almost like Soraka. If you hit your Q as Soraka, then your heal is stronger. Here, if you hit your, your Q or your ult to CC the enemies, then your healing and shielding is also stronger. I do want to mention that her passive grants move speed to you or, or to allies depending on who is running towards the other, which is something you can optimize that I'll talk about in the 1% later. Okay, moving on to combos, and Janna is not a very combo-centric champion. As you already probably know, I only talk about combos that you're likely to use in games, not these really fancy ones that are never going to happen. So the basic uh, combo that you want to know about with Janna is that her Q if it's channeled in fog, they cannot see your Q. So this can be, um, let's say that this is an enemy. Um, they will see the charging tornado if I'm in vision like this. If I charge the tornado from fog, then they won't see it until it starts doing that. If I channel it in fog and then become in vision, then they will see the channeling again. So make sure that you are in fog when you're looking for these types of cues. The most common time that this is going to be relevant is in laning phase when you are standing in bushes you're channeling in fog, you're staying in fog, and then once it uh, releases, then you can move out, and then that'll be the hardest for them to react to. Another combo that you can kind of think of is W and then Q. So you just slow them down and then Q them so that you can land that Q, because if they're running away, it can be a little bit awkward to land Q, but if they're slowed by your W, then it's easy. There are some little optimizations you can make for her E and her ult. I will mention that her E does decay. Um, so what this means is that you want to use it as late as possible right before damage instances I'm going to talk about this in the 1% later as well And then in terms of her ult you just want to be able to cancel um, Important abilities. So in terms of combos there really aren't many for Janna It's just more about how to use her kit as effectively as possible. Okay moving on to early game explanation So if you haven't already I strongly recommend for you to check out the early game section of my enchanter guide It's going to be linked in the description below it fully explains what to do and why. I'm going to summarize early lane first here. You want to try to hit level two first by hitting the first two waves of minions constantly, no matter what the matchup. And then what you want to try to do after that is to continuously perma shove, overwhelm them with minions, poke them out, ship their tower, pressure for your team, ward selfishly for your lane, force the enemy jungler to attend to your lane if you can, if you can uh, safely do that. And the matchups where you wouldn't be able to be uh, safe in doing so would be the Blitz, the Thresh, the Pikes. If you verse uh, a ranged, if you verse an enchant lane or a mage lane that is difficult, you can try to do this. And if you succeed, great. If you fail, whatever. But this is how you want to pressure the map uh, and pressure early lane. I call this the Perma War of Attrition. Getting and maintaining a minion HP advantage and slowly bleeding your enemies out. And Janna can do this versus enchanters and engagers because her disengage of her Q and lane allows her to dominate engagers early, which is very rare for an enchanter. The only champs that you'll want to look to freeze on your side of the lane instead of perma shoving, like I said, the Blitz, Pike, Thresh, and maybe Nort. So if you freeze it on your side of the lane, then you don't have to overextend to contest minions. They struggle to all in you if you're so close to your tower. So remember, this won't always be possible, but this is a strategy that you want to try and do. And you will be able to win some losing matchups like this if you play for the Pearl War of Attrition. Okay, so when you're versus engagers, it is very important that you stand practically on top of your ADC at all times. Okay, then you can always in 
disengage their engage attempts. If you stand away, then they can engage on your ADC without you being able to easily cue them away. So, verse engages, you don't want to contest bushes, generally. You want to shove, poke, be annoying, but hold your cue for their engage. So don't go around fishing for cues, using it willy-nilly. Hold your cue and play for that permal war of attrition. So, that's engage lanes. Engage lanes are very simple. For enchanter lanes, here comes the tricky balance with Jana. Obviously, when you're perma shoving, you're not in fog, and you can't do the invisible tornadoes, which can kind of win a lane single-handedly if you hit a really good one. So once, once the priority of the wave has been established, then you can dip into fog and fish for cues. So this is once you have already secured prior on a wave, and there's nothing they can do about it. Or once they've secured prior on a wave, and there's nothing you can do about it, then you can look to fish for cues. So you don't have to queue from the bush. If you can't control the bush, you can just channel it in lane and then start to get creative. There'll be more on how to use Q and lane um, in the review section and in the 1%, so just try it out a bunch, okay? Okay, I want to talk about trading in lane now. So you should be able to proc your spell thieves versus engagers constantly. You know, you just want to be a psycho. Run at their faces. Dare them to get frustrated and engage and never waste your Q. Versus enchanters, auto attack Q, auto attack while shielding yourself is the best bet. Then you can proc all your three spell thieves because Jana, just trading in general is not the greatest. Um, but otherwise a Q with an auto attack is good too. If you get to channel up your Q and then you can trade without them being able to return the trade. So yeah, try to take these windows when you have three spell thieves stacked to proc, to proc all of them in one trade and then back off so that you're not constantly getting whittled down. Moving on from the early laning phase towards the rest of the early game, now it depends on which identity you've chosen for the game. Did you choose laning? Did you choose roaming? And this isn't an arbitrary decision, this should be taking into account your lane matchup and the comps in general, like how your mid jungle is against their mid jungle, how strong you are against the enemy bot lane. So anyway, if you have chosen the laning identity, like I said you want to rush mythic, but you also never really want to leave bot except when you're warding the shallow enemy jungle to deter ganks on your lane, or you know to respond to a river skirmish if it's right next to you. Be prepared to ping your jungler to not gank your lane if you are winning the perma war of attrition. Your gank setup is not the most reliable and remember you want to dominate in the 2v2. There will be times where you can just sit back, uh, your jungler is you know on your side of the map, you can fish for a Q, if it hits great you can go for the gank, if it doesn't you don't really want to waste too much time as remember you do want to be pressuring the 2v2 uh, if possible. In a lot of situations you're not going to be able to pressure the 2v2 and then when your jungler is around on your side of the map then you can definitely look to set up a gank with your Q. So if, you're, if you chose a roaming identity, then you want to try to hit level 3, base for your boots, and then just pra practically perma roam. If you choose this path, that means that you can't really contest the 2v2. And so most time that you choose to spend bot, uh, post level 3 is a waste. And I'm talking about level 3 because when you have all of your abilities unlocked, then your roams are as um, impactful as possible. So when you have all your abilities, you have your boots, you have your sweeper, it is time to generate pressure elsewhere because it can't be bot. Camp mid. Fish for cues from the bush. Get used to finding cues around the mid lane. You know, if the mid laner walks up to contest CS, maybe that's a time to use it. Or you can channel it in fog, run forwards. Their first reaction is to run backwards into your nado. You know, just get used to it. Play around with queuing around mid terrain. You also generally just want to link up with your jungler, and that's how you can create pressure and just be annoying. Um, contest everything, move around, use your mobility. So the only main windows to be bot are to prevent dives. Um, or to try and crash frozen waves near the enemy turret when your ADC is starting to overextend you and they need you to back them up just to shove a wave. Or to prevent plates falling um, if the enemy bot is hitting the tower. Or if you're ganking with your jungler. But that's once again linking up with your jungler and generally pressuring through mid instead of bot. So if you do choose this roaming option, you practically are a second jungler at this point by all metrics. You want to facilitate heralds uh, post 8 minutes as well something to keep in mind, and around that 8 minutes and onwards mark, you can shove mid and pressure top river when your jungler is going to do the same. So there will be some fights and skirmishes in the early game before towers start to fall, and the main point for skirmishes is to make the most of your queue. You can look for creative queues, you can fish for queues in lane, if you miss, whatever, but in skirmishes, it's going to cost you and your team a lot if you do go for these risky queues and miss. So you kind of want to flip a switch when you move out of lane into skirmishes, make the most of your queue. You can just quick channel, cast a queue onto anyone, make sure it hits someone and get that glacial. 
And the same is going to go for your ult. So if there are some team fights in the early game when you do have your ult, get that full channel of your ult and make sure that you can knock someone away as well so that you amplify the healing from your E passive. Okay, so that's just a lot of talk. I want to get into some examples so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so for this first game, we are Twitch Janna versus Kaiser Seraphine. And the setup that I decided to go with was the um, laning setup in the secondary rooms. <clears throat> we have a Poppy and a Vigar, so it's going to be really tricky to pressure around the mid jungle. And Bot is losing uh, on paper, so it's already kind of an awkward Janna game to play. However, I decide that my best bet is to try and pressure in the 2v2 lane. And so I take the uh, Font of Life and Revitalize. Um, and just in general, if you're not really sure what to do, defaulting to Font of Life and Revitalize is the way to go. Anyway, let's jump into the game. And what I'm going to be looking to do here is to try and get level 2 as always, and then just see how we go from there. Because it's not really up to us to win the early lane. If they want to get prior, if Kaiser wants to spam Q, then that's what she can do. So I'm going to be looking for windows to auto attack the wave safely whenever possible to try and get that level two first. And so here I, I'm dipping into the bush briefly to try and Q and then auto and then back off because I really don't want these extended trades. I get the Q. Unfortunately, I cancel my auto attack, which sucks. But what you can see is now I am going to be looking constantly to auto attack the wave and avoid any trades whatsoever that they want to look for. And this is just a great example of why you don't want to look for naked auto attack trades as enchanters versus ADCs, okay? So just have a look at what happens here. From the Seraphine's perspective, I'm never going to be looking for any kind of auto attack trades with the Kaiser. However, Seraphine takes some auto attack trades with Twitch and she's always going to come out the worst for wear. So this is just a great example of why you wouldn't want to do that. Going back to what I'm looking to do, once again, try to auto attack as much as possible, pressure the lane as much as possible, avoiding any trades. And now, you know, we lost level two. I have accepted reality. I'm not going to like throw my body at them and just, you know, try to heavy trade or get two first as it's not possible. I'm staying healthy, accepting reality. And I'm just going to be waiting for that moment when maybe they crash a wave and then they don't really have a minion HP advantage going forwards and they've taken some poor trades. So when we're healthy, then that window is going to eventually come to potentially pressure the 2v2. So being very disciplined here, being very safe. Okay. And once again, I'm looking for those fast trades and then back off like a Q and then an auto attack. So unfortunately, I cancel my auto attack once again here, but it's the concept that you should be looking for here. That would be a great time to find an auto attack. I do find an auto attack on the back end here. <clears throat> and here's the situation where they've taken some really poor trades. So even though we lose the shove on paper in the 2v2, we're a lot healthier and maybe we can start to pressure the lane soon. I also want to, I, I forgot to talk about it, but I want to just talk about my Q here. So here is where um, I can't control the bushes and so I can't channel it from fog. So I'm trying to use my body language to suggest that the, the queue is going through the minions or maybe that's just where they normally go. And I'm starting to get creative with my queues and getting her to run into them starting those mind games. So same song and dance for now. However, um, the next wave here, maybe we can start to pressure in the 2v2. <clears throat> and so once again, I'm trying to be unpredictable with my queues. Make her second guess herself. I know people's tendencies, uh, they normally expect the queue to go straight up through the lane and they will try to juke really hard on one side and then against the wall I can easily land it. Taking very short disciplined trades, staying healthy. And as you can see, the health difference here, it's going to be really tricky for them to now maintain 2v2 pressure. And so you can see I'm starting to move up here. I'm starting to pressure now and I don't want them to be able to hit the way for free anymore. You can see my body language really shifted. If she tries to hit, goes uh, for a last hit on these minions, I'm going to try to punish her. And it's what I try to do here. I get spaced out a little bit here. Um, so that was well done by them, but still their HP bars are not doing too hot. And we're starting to move forwards now. In a lane matchup that you never really should be able to. Okay, and so what happens here is I get to control the bushes now, and that's great because now I can start to fish for those cues in fog um, if it's not going to, you know, lose the lane's pressure. And so I find um, 
bush control of the mid bush here. And what the Kaiser should do is just, you know, start to sack some last hits. But she doesn't. She moves up for this last hit, and then I get to land my Q. And now the lane is pretty much one for us. What I'm going to do in response to this is I'm going to exhaust her. And I don't care how she responds to the situation. I just know that she has to respond in some way. Either she heals and then Seraphine exhausts the Twitch and then she's still going to be really chunked or she's going to heal and flash or something's going to happen. So I'm placing a lot of pressure on her. Seraphine walks up too far now as well and then she's going to flash and now they're both flashless, both really chunked out. They've lost control of the wave in a really good matchup for them. Okay, so let's talk about how this lane has shifted. So on paper, it's a really bad matchup, but we, we are winning the 2v2 now. And so now what I want to do is play for that permanent War of Attrition. Dominate the 2v2 lane, ward up the shallow enemy jungle to deter any kind of ganks and just pressure them constantly under tower, force Kaiser to eventually take a base and lose an entire wave under the tower. Unfortunately, I get a little bit greedy here. So I go for quite a shallow ward because I want to stay in lane and pressure as much as possible, you know, poke, uh, use this wave as much as possible, hit the tower as much as possible. I should have used this window to get deeper wards. Potentially a ward here because Talon is mobile, maybe a ward here as well. I have two wards, and so I only placed one. Pretty shallow, pretty greedy, so we'll see how that plays out. But in terms of just a 2v2 with dominating them, I just need to back it up with some vision. And so now I'm just perma shopping, perma war of attrition. I'm never going to just let it, the wave push into us and allow Kaiser to base for free, come back to lane without losing much. So I'm hitting the wave, and this is just my game plan for the foreseeable future now, until they base or we base. And I want them to base first. And so we're going to see that my lack of, um, you know, warding for the 2v2 Pimmer War of Attrition is going to bite me in the ass here. I walk too far forwards and then Talon jumps over the wall, so champs like Rek'Sai or Talon you know, or Zack or Kane. You really want to think about how you could get ganked when you are dominating the 2v2, so I should have warded over here. So I'm gonna blow my flash. It's not the end of the world. We can still try to shove and dominate as much as possible. <clears throat> and then our Poppy is here. So she's gonna run forwards. And it's a bit of a scrappy fight all around, but we do manage to get the kill onto the Seraphine. Let's just skip forward a little bit here. And so now we just want to crash a wave in base. Whenever you're really low, you want to get a reset off. You need to crash a wave so you have a good wave state and so that your ADC can spend as much money as possible. Okay, all is going smoothly so far. I am indexing into laning. Um, I want to rush my Mythic, dominate the 2v2, because that's just how the trajectory of this game is going, right? Maybe they're not the, the best laners, maybe we can just use the advantage we have now to continue to apply 2v2 pressure, and I really don't want to run towards a Vega lane where you're not really going to be able to achieve anything. So I pretty much run straight back to bot, and I want to try to dominate the 2v2 again. We get a window to just kind of jump out on the Seraphine. She's not respecting the Twitch queue, so whatever. Get some free lane control there. I'm pinking aggressively for my lane. I'm not putting a pink anywhere around mid lane because once again, I want to play for that 2v2 domination. <clears throat> and I want to force Talon to gank our lane so that he can't pressure the rest of the map or so that he can't farm up as much. And there you can see um, my trades, I, I'm autoing with an E so that I don't get chunked out too hard and then I'm using my Q as well to get a couple of uh, Spell Thief stacks. Perma War of Attrition, Perma Shove. Pressuring, scaling up for free in a really tricky matchup. I'm going to start to sound like a broken record, I just do want to show you that you, you really want to keep this up. And unfortunately my ADC roams here for no reason, so I'm pinging him to try and, and shove the wave here. If he doesn't want to do it, whatever. So he eventually does listen. And here I'm trying to fish for cues from Fog. So this is, when you have lane control like this, and they can't really pressure too much, you can af afford to go fishing with your cues, right? And so <clears throat> I'm channeling it in Fog. And what I want to do is run at her, and then I want her initial reaction to be to try and run away. And then for her to run away into my queue. You can see the thought process here it doesn't quite work out. I am trying to be creative here. 
and then my Poppy just kind of hex flashes over and does a very creative gank. I don't really care if Poppy ganks our lane or not. Like, we have established 2v2 control. So either our jungler is farming up and pressuring mid or top instead. Either way, we're going to accrue an advantage in the 2v2 or at least force the enemy jungler to waste his time. If Poppy decides to look for kills like this, that more power to him. But it's not really important for us. As you can see, I am still just straight rushing my Mythic, not planning to leave bot practically at all. Jungler spending a lot of time bot, and they are getting rewarded for it, so whatever. Once again, I am really not spending too much time away from bot. I want to dominate in the 2v2. And that's, you can see this is happening, right? We have a big CS lead, we have a tower plate lead, we have a pressure lead, we have vision, they have practically no vision around bot river. We're overwhelming them while we have a hard outscaling bot lane and their win condition is to win early. So this is just a fantastic place for the game to be in. And it's just been achieved through pretty basic stuff, through discipline, disciplined trades, wave management, and you know, just picking the right times to throw out those cues. Okay, so for the next game, we are Draven Jana versus Israel Bard. And this is um, a little bit of a tricky one to figure out which secondary runes to use. I uh, end up opting for the roaming builds. Um, I, it's kind of a, a mix of what I choose. I choose the boots and I choose some roaming. So my thought process was that I didn't really need the laning stats to be able to dominate lane. I can kind of do both. And it was a bit of a greedy decision there. Maybe the better decision would be Font of Life and Revitalize because roaming towards a Vlad is going to be really useless as well. But anyway, let's jump into it. We have a hard winning lane. Draven is going to dominate. And once again, you just want to play for the, the early prior, try to get level two first and then go from there. And what I'm going to look to do is play that Pimmer War of Attrition. So I want to overwhelm them with pressure, with minions, finding windows to poke them and then preventing Bard from roaming for free. Um, so if he does want to roam, then his ADC is going to pay the price. That's the idea. I don't want Bard roaming, and then I roam in response, and then he's playing his game, and I'm not quite at the same level of roaming. And then Draven and Israel are left on an island where Israel can just farm up for free. So that's my thought process. <coughs> okay. Um, so... We're going to be looking to, to hit the wave a little bit here. I'm trading with the, the Q and the auto, as you can see, and then kind of backing off and looking to hit the wave. So you can see I'm actively looking to hit minions whenever possible. I want to ensure that we get level two first. And I'm also not going to be contesting Bush when you know he has his passive and his Q coming up and my trades are really poor. So you can see that every decision I make in the lane is with uh, reason and tying into Jana's identity. So I'm not contesting this side. I'm dodging his cues, I'm hitting minions, I'm hitting level two first. And then they have to respect our level two spike or we're gonna get a big trade out of it. So now I feel confident in posturing forwards. Maybe I can find a cue here from Fog, otherwise they can respect. And so now I'm being creative. I'm trying to find a cue, trying to be unpredictable with where I throw it. And so what I mean with this unpredictability of the cue, I pretend like I'm going for Israel, but instead I'm trying to throw out a cue to hit the board. And that, is what happens. So I'm running at Israel and then I'm kind of like walking this way like I'm going to go for him, but then I throw it at the bard instead. <clears throat> Once again, just play around with your cues. Okay, so like I said, Pimmel War of Attrition, looking to hit minions, poking them out, Q and auto there again. I should be hitting minions a little bit faster here, but you can see the intent. Okay, so I'm just going to speed this up a little bit, dominating in the 2v2. And there's going to be a fight that erupts around Bot River, and I was a bit slow to move, but also Israel is stuck under the tower. So here, I'm going to channel up my Q because I know that they, their only option is to try and exit out of the pit, right? So I don't need to just do a really small queue. I can channel it in this general direction and someone's going to get hit. And so we get the Ramus. We get to chase them down a little bit here. What happens is I try to set up some more kills with flash into queue. However, I just used my Glacial on the Tornado here earlier. So this wasn't a good learning point for me. 
that I, I do need to kind of keep track of my glacial cooldown. <clears throat> However, we still maintain pressure in the bot lane. What we want to try and do now, since we are low, try and shove and get that base off. So we can spend our money, we can heal up. And then another creative cue. Um, I'm going to pretend like I'm heavy trading in this direction, and then I'm going to really channel it up. And he's going to expect me to never just queue in this random direction. And so <laughs> that's exactly what I do. Um, anyway, shove and base. So all in all, it's been a pretty clean early game. We have a big lead in CS. We have a big, uh, you know, pressure lead in the bot. We have the first base. We have a good wave state off of our base. I am indexing into lane stats. So this is just going to be another lane domination type of game. So we're maintaining a freeze here. So if Bard does choose to roam, then um, Israel is going to be stuck with the impossible task of trying to break or contest minions in a 1v2 freeze. And so Draven's just going to get further and further ahead. So Bard is kind of forced to come back down here and relieve some pressure. Okay, so this is where you don't really want your jungler to gank. So I should have been spam pinging him to back off. I do already ping him once to back off. But he really does want to look for something here. But this way he's pushing into them. I don't really have the greatest gank setup unless I can just kind of find a miraculous queue. It's just going to be really tricky. So I do end up being able to exhaust the Israel, so I feel like this will force him to flash if we play it well enough. So my Draven flashes, which is really bad from him, but we do end up forcing that flash. And then I find a, a pretty good tornado. So after all is said and done, we get to crash a big wave and chunk them out really hard. Okay, we're going to jump forwards in this game. I want to show you a skirmish. And so, like I said, when skirmishes come around, you do want to put extra emphasis on landing your cues. You don't want to look for too many creative channeling cues. It's really important that you do make the most of it and find a cue. So let's see how that plays out here. At least the concept. <laughs> so there's a bard portal coming here, and then I want to I want to cue the bard portal, right? But unfortunately, the bard portal just kind of ended before the end of the wall, and then I miss it. However, Ramus flashes in, and then I get my full channel alt, getting as much value out of it as possible. And then. I'm going to channel my Q here, and this is, I, I channel it for a little bit because I know that they have to run forwards here and I will be able to get a knock up there. So this, like, obviously the result is pretty bad, but this is generally how you want to approach skirmishes. Make the most of your ult, get that full channel, and don't get too risky with your Q usage. Okay, so in this game we are Israel Jana versus Samira Nautilus, and my setup is quite tailored to surviving lane, as I don't expect to be able to roam around and I really want to just minimize the early game because they want to snowball the laning phase, I don't want that to happen. Also the mid matchup, I have a Zerus versus Swain, so once again it's not the most volatile mid matchup for me to roam around uh, early on to. So what I want to do in this type of matchup, I want to survive, stay healthy, freeze and just scale up. Okay, so that's what I want to look for. Um, we are going to look to try to get level 2 first if that is possible. But versus Nautilus, it is a lot trickier to contest the minion mode. Because if you get hooked, especially with the Samira, you can just get one shot. And then Nautilus, is, Nautilus misses his Q, and that gives me some space to walk up. Proc my Spell Thieves, order the wave a bunch, and then I notice that they, the Nautilus hasn't saved his Relic stacks for the second wave melees. And we can potentially get a surprise level 2 first here. So we get level 2, and we have a brief window here to jump in and get something done. And that's exactly what we do. So obviously this shouldn't happen on paper, but this is just a good example of if you do play for the level two first, you can win matchups where you're not supposed to win. Let's keep going. My Ezreal gets um, <laughs> way too uh, frisky at the end there. I deem that I cannot crash and shove this wave, so I'm just going to instantly base. And you can see I, I'm going to get my boots and I'm going to roam. So I could have definitely just opted in for laning stats and rushing my mythic. However, I feel comfortable in just allowing my Israel to farm in a 1v2 lane and then I can prevent the dives while I am still pressuring around my mid jungle. Even though my mid jungle isn't the easiest to pressure around early on, I have a window right now as there's no point in running back bot because by the time I get there, the wave is gonna have crashed anyway. So instead, I'm going to pressure with my mid jungle. I have my Q. And if something happens around top river, or if something happens top, then I'll be there. So Lee takes a fight, and then I'm here to back up my jungler. 
And so the specifics of what happens here, so we get a kill, but just going back, this is just about making sure that you're always pressuring somewhere. If it's not bot, link up with your middle your jungle, okay? And if this was a more volatile mid matchup, or if the wave was pushing into my mid laner, then I could look to uh, make a play on mid. However, the way that this is all set up, uh, the only place I can pressure is around my jungle. Because once again, if I ran bot, there would be absolutely nothing to achieve down here. And so you just want to be on the lookout for those situations where you're not achieving anything bot. Maybe you're losing bot and you can't contest priority and your ADC is not really in threat of getting dove. Then, you know, play around your mid, play around your jungle. In the examples that I'm showing, I, I'm getting these difficult matchups, but we are winning uh, the 2v2 anyway. And that incentivizes me to continue to play for the 2v2. But that's not always going to be the case for everyone. So just make sure you're pressuring the whole time. So we get a kill on the rumble up here, and then I'm going to base. And all the meanwhile, um, the, the big wave kind of crashed and now it's building into my Israel. So I want to make sure that my Israel is safe in collecting this big wave. I also noticed that he just had to use his long E cooldown. So that's a bit dangerous. He needs some protection. We can't prevent this wave from crashing. It is far too big. So I'm just going to make sure that my tower doesn't take too much damage. I'm going to shield that. And then my Israel is going to catch this wave, that's fine. So around this window, I could be roaming um, instead, but once again, my mid lane, it's not very volatile. Uh, it's dangerous to move around in the river as well right now. Their uh, support and their jungler is far stronger than us, and my jungler is just farming, not active on the map right now. So I'm happy in just kind of hanging around bot and pinging that they're probably in bot river. And we'll see how that develops. So this wave is going to build, and then I, th we, I believe we noticed that their ADC kind of showed on this mid ward, just keeping an eye on the minimap here. You can see Samira showed there, and this gives us an opportunity to crash uh, the next wave. So I really want to look for an opportunity to crash the stacking wave, otherwise we're going to get frozen on in all end. And we see that their bot lane is just making a play mid, and my team was, you know, alerted beforehand, so that's fine. We're going to use this opportunity. To concede, prior, uh, to concede pressure around this area while generating pressure around this area. So that's perfectly fine. We're happy with that. Now I have a window to move around and pressure the map. And once again, there's not much for me to do. This window I could be pressuring, but yeah, the, the mid matchup is not looking the greatest. And instead I'm just going to hang around, catch some XP and potentially prevent them from crashing away. So I want to maintain that freeze. And you can see here that they do try to find an all-in on the Israel. It is going to be tricky. He has a dash. I have my Q. And I'm just trying to hit both of them with my Q. I missed the Nautilus, but I do interrupt the Samira at least. And we take a pretty heavy trade on exit. So that's fine. And then I'm trying to stand out here to prevent the wave from crashing so that we can farm safely. And we successfully do so. So now this... Uh, short range all in lane has to try and deal with the wave way out here and try to crash it which can be very awkward for them which is exactly what i want so eventually this is going to slow push out from us uh, my jungler is doing a pretty bad gank i'm not really sure what they're expecting to happen but at the very least i'm going to use their proximity here to crash the stacking wave and this is just going to give me a window to roam a little bit faster okay so we crash this wave i find a base and I get my Swifties, and so I'm really not looking to index into lane stats right now. I really want to just, you know, move around. And I don't expect to uh, be trading 2v2 much more as the game goes on. Okay, so moving towards mid, if something happened around here, I would be able to impact that. There's nothing for me to achieve bot as we crash that wave, and then this is going to be slow pushing. So I'm just looking to pressure around mid. That's the only place that I can pressure. Once again, I'm constantly thinking about where I should be pressuring. Mid is the only lane right now that I can pressure. And so I'm going to channel a Q and fog and then try to try to land it. And you can just see it's very unique for an enchanted to be able to find an engage like this. But, you know, we get a big chunk on mid and we're obviously very happy with that. And what I tried to do here, once again, I was trying to show right before my tornado comes out so that he sees me and his first instinct is to run he reacts pretty slowly and doesn't dodge it but you know anyway we get a big chunk we get some mid pressure 
All the meanwhile, my ADC is uh, dealing with a wave here by himself, which is fine. And so I'm pressuring with a jungler. Whatever they're looking to do, I can facilitate. Okay, just playing around mid once again. So there's going to be a skirmish around here, and I'm fine with a fight in this type of area because, um, you know, I can front to back this. I'm not in danger of dying. And so I'm not immediately pressured to queue the Nautilus here because he's a bit out of position. I want to channel a queue in this corridor to prevent any potential backup that might be coming for them. Um, and then, you know, I knock them all up. My banner gets a big ult and fight is pretty straightforward. And I just want to mention that my full channel ult, uh, very important in these skirmishes to fully channel your ult. And so I was a bit slow here. I could have potentially knocked the Lee away and then my Diana could move forwards. Um, I think my, no, I do have enough mana, so that was a misplay for me, but I do knock it, knock the Lee away and, and get the healing on the back end here. And you can see how important every tick of the heal is potentially. We prevented bot from achieving their win con of snowballing just with basic stuff, with fundamentals. We hit the waves, we hit level two first, we used our level two spike. I made decisions based on waves constantly. Either I am holding a freeze bot, or if I can't do anything bot, then I'm roaming. And since I'm versus this uh, all in lane, I am not wasting my cues looking to go fishing with it. I am saving it if myself or my ADC gets hooked, then I'm able to disengage. Okay, so we've seen Janna versus an Enchanter, versus a Playmaker, versus an Engager. Let's check out Janna versus a Warden. And I am fully expecting to dominate the 2v2 in this matchup. Even on paper, I am indexing into lane domination. And so this is where I did try out Aerie versus a Warden. I would in the future still go Glacial over this, but I wanted to be able to poke out the Braum consistently and then still be able to roam and I didn't really feel like I needed any lane stats. So this is a pretty greedy setup, um, but apart from that let's just jump into it. And I did try a W start once again, I think that you should always start Q, so this was when I was still testing a bunch of different builds, however I do want to look to hit the wave and hit two first, although I don't want to shove too hard. Uh, because I do want to build up, build up a wave early on, and then I can permish up from there. Okay. So I'm making sure that we are going to hit level 2 first, and then I'm looking to poke the Braum whenever he walks up, which is pretty easy. We hit level 2 first, still stacking a wave. Looking to poke when I can, and on this following wave we're going to look to crash this wave, and then we'll probably start the permanent War of Attrition. And I'm pretty comfortable in fishing for a Q in this lane, and especially with this wave state where they can't do anything about it. I'm deciding to Q from the lane because I don't really want to tank a Braum Q uh, if I try it from a bush, as I don't have E. Um, and so I'm just starting to get creative with my Qs already, and I kind of guide him into my Q here. Get a big chunk there. I noticed the enemy jungler is top, so um, I started Trinket so that I could be able to ward on this window. However, their jungler is showing top, so I'm more than happy in just dominating in the 2v2. And so my ADC doesn't really realize what's going on, and she wastes a huge amount of time and pressure. I'm pinging to just hit the tower, but what can you do? And I'm poking in the... And I'm poking while they're trying to farm on the tower. Okay. And so now, uh, after that trade, the Kaiser's really low, and I really want to make sure that we're perma-shoving and forcing Kaiser to eventually miss an entire wave under tower. You can see I'm hitting this wave. I'm using the Q. Honestly, I didn't really try to hit uh, either one of them with the Q. I wanted to just uh, hit the wave so that we can perma-shove, and there is a chance that, with my creative Qs so far, that they don't expect it straight down the middle. Um, so I did just throw it straight down the middle to shove this wave. And they're just in a horrible position. So I noticed that there is a fight going on up here. And if there wasn't a fight here, then I would be more than happy to just absolutely dominate the 2v2. This is one of the very rare instances where I am going to leave the lane early. Otherwise, I just want to be generating a 2v2 advantage as much as, much as possible. But there is a skirmish going on nearby. So I'm happy to move to this. And I have first move, obviously, because we're winning the 2v2 lane. And then we get a couple of kills over here. So that's all well and good. And this kind of gave um, Kaiser a window to base. So we, we traded a little bit of bot 2v2 pressure, but it was worth it. 
what we want to do now is shove this wave and then find a base ourselves. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And I'm going to be indexing into lane stats as I don't expect to roam around. Once again, because of the nature of this 2v2 matchup and because my mid laner is you know, so hard to play around. So a lot of the games that I did get footage for, unfortunately, a lot of the mid matchups were not volatile whatsoever. So what I want to point out is if this mid lane matchup was volatile, I could use this window to roam and then potentially impact uh, around mid here. And then I can come back bot um, on the following wave, but I deem that uh, this mid matchup is really hard to pressure at all. And I tried to get back uh, to lane in time to hold the freeze, although I wasn't quite quick enough. So instead, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be, you know, building a wave now, preventing them from last hitting around here, and then eventually crashing a stacked wave and then playing that perma war of attrition. Okay, wave is building, they're going to have trouble farming. So even though the wave is good for them, it's pushing into them, they still have to, you know, try and last hit some minions all the way up here on our side of the lane, which is going to be tricky for them. And so you can see how confident I am trading heavily. Um, I'm not going to be doing this versus, you know, a, a Nautilus or a Pike. Uh, but especially versus uh, a Warden, I can get right up in their face and just confidently proc my Spell Thieves, which is exactly what I'm doing. Um, my server walks way too far forwards, as if we're going for an all-in, so she's just going to randomly die, whatever. And you can see there's a skirmish going on, so I'm making sure that my Q gets some utility. I'm making sure that it hits. I'm not channeling a huge creative... Uh, Q on the back end here or anything. Okay, let's move forwards. And so I'm trying to hold the freeze here. As always, my decisions are based around waves. So if I can hold the freeze here, then, you know, we're going to hold the freeze and they're going to lose a bunch of minions. And if I can't hold the freeze, then I'm forcing them to break the freeze. So Kaisa was going to base around here, but now she has to run all the way up in lane and then I'm going to slow her down and then she has to walk up some more. And now her tempo is kind of screwed and she has to deal with another wave. My ABC is back, my jungler is still around. And so potentially some wave management got us this kill, at least it would get us a lead. Okay, so we get a couple kills on the back end here, let's speed it up. You know the drill by now, shove this wave and get a base off. Once again I could use this window uh, to run mid, but you know, my, my Hecarim has no ult, my Vlad is very low threat and I would rather make sure that they can't crash any wave. So I'm really just playing the dominate the 2v2 here. And we have two ways of going about this. We can try to maintain an, uh, a freeze on the outside of the lane, or we can just perma shove and poke. The way that the map is set up right now, um, you know, we have no vision on bot side. Our mid's getting shoved in, our jungle is basing on top side. It feels a little bit dangerous to perma shove and try to face check and get some vision around this area. So on this window, I just I want more information on the enemy jungle. So I'm more than happy in just trying to maintain a freeze and poke them out. Which is what we're doing. Kaisa is getting poked out. Okay, and then there's going to be a bit of a half all-in fight. Okay, and now we have info on the enemy jungle. The Kaisa is really low, my jungle is on my side of the lane. Of the map so I am a lot more comfortable in playing for the 2v2. Okay so there's a fight here and here I'm, I'm gonna get a little bit creative with the Q I'm going to channel it because um, I know that she has to walk through this corridor to chase so once again um, it, it is always better to land a channel the Q if you can but just be aware that if you do miss a Q in skirmishes the, the cost is really high. Okay, so once again, just the state of the map, we have our mid tower is gone, our jungler is not pressuring the map, and we do have some great vision, but I'm more comfortable in just holding the freeze and generating a 2v2 lead, um, and not looking to move around and pressure through mid, because my Vlad's just going to be farming under tier 2 anyway, and so I don't really want to open ourselves up for Ari to gank us. And so they, they're going to struggle to crash a wave up here, we're going to struggle to die around here. And so we're just maintaining the freeze. Kaisa is bleeding a lot of minions. Okay, so I don't want to look at this one too much more. I just wanted to show if you are versus Warden how you can take a lot more aggressive trades in the lane and how you can really look to dominate in the 2v2. All right, moving on to the mid to late game explanation. 
I encourage you to check out my mid to late game guide and the mid to late game section of the Enchanter guide. Jana does not deviate far from these blueprints. So to summarize mid to late, you want to do three main things. Mid first, vision and pressure. So mid first means warding mid lane and contesting mid wave prior when possible, when nothing urgent is happening elsewhere. And this is important because pressuring the map stems from mid lane. Waves crash first in the mid, and you can translate mid pressure to anywhere else on the map. If you can't contest mid prior, then what you want to do is sack mid and pressure uh, in a side or group up with your jungler while they get mid prior. And then it's harder to control the map uh, in those situations. Okay, so um, enchanters, they generally struggle to safely ward and face check um, without forcing enemies to react to a wave. Jana is included, is included in this, and that's why you want to force them to react to a mid wave so then you can actually safely pressure them out. Okay, moving on to vision. So you want to get that mid ward down and then you want to try to use the remaining two wards to control an enemy quadrant. So this is the one mid two quadrant rule. Um, and this is only if there is a controlled pace of game. So there might be a very fast paced game and Jana does thrive in those. So it's going to be harder to safely put two wards in a quadrant and one in mid. Maybe you're going to have to use uh, your ward a little bit more chaotically, but that's the idea that you want to try and do. Moving on to pressure, you want to link up with your jungler. You want to pressure where they want to pressure. So I want to reiterate, this is a macro blueprint, okay? When nothing pressing is happening on the map, if there is no nearby fight or if no one is overextended in the sides, if there are people that are extended uh, in the sides, you can move over to them and you can help to catch them out or you can save your allies, or you can move to skirmishes. Once again, Janna is the most mobile enchanter, and so you do want to use her mobility to move around and embrace chaotic game paces. Okay, moving on to team fights and skirmishes, and now we're going to get some points specifically for Janna. You want to have deliberate cues and to make the most of your R. So you would have seen some of these examples in the early skirmishes. Team fights, exact same concept. Make sure you get the most value you can out of your Q and your ult. You, you want to full channel it, you want to cancel enemies, dashes, and mobility. So it is fine to go fishing and lane for queues. If you miss, you know, you can hit the wave, you can avoid trades, you can roam, etc. But in team fights and in skirmishes, you may be giving a crucial window for the enemy team engaged to find their engage. You don't need that magical queue hitting someone, uh, the full channeled queue to start a fight. You need to play front to back and disengage their engage, and then you're in a great spot. The same applies to making the most of your R. You rarely want to just use your R as like a mini fountain heal for the team. You want to disengage their engage and get that uh, bonus heal and the CC. In general, you want to use your Q and your R knockups to cancel enemy abilities and to stand by or even slightly behind your carries to make sure that you can consistently get these spells off. What goes a long way here in terms of team fights is making a mental note of what abilities you want to cancel with your Q and R before you enter a team fight. Maybe even in loading screen, you have a look and see what you want to be looking to Q and Alt. What their engaged tools are, which champions they, they have that they're going to go forwards with. That way you can prime yourself to react to it. Um, as if you're, uh, if you're anticipating it, it's much easier than if you're just hoping to react fast in the middle of a chaotic team fight. The more that you can break down and uh, compartmentalize team fights, the, the easier it becomes because there are so many variables to take into consideration in a team fight. Prime yourself with how you expect to use your abilities beforehand. So be disciplined with your Q, with your ult usage. If you never use your Q, if you never use your ult, and the enemy engage never uses their engage, you're gonna come out in a much better position. So be patient, be disciplined. And then, uh, as always, for enchanters, you wanna fight front to back, okay? This is standard team fighting for enchanters. Ensure that you have your front line between yourself and the enemy. So you wanna position selfishly and make sure you stay alive. The longer the fight goes on with an enchanter, with Janna, the happier you should be. Okay, so here's the first game, and I already know that I want to cancel either Lee or Talon's engage tools with my ult and potentially my Q. So we can see what happens in this skirmish here. I'm going to be channeling a Q to prevent Kaiser from entering this way, and then I'm going to be ulting the lead to disengage here. Unfortunately, my Vega doesn't trust me, and so he just flashes anyway. But you can see I successfully disengage. I get to channel my Q for as long as safe, my ult for as long as safely possible, and then I Q in this corridor, and then everyone would be successfully disengaged. Okay, moving on to the next game, and we're getting absolutely destroyed in this game. I just wanted to use this one as an example to uh, you know, these situations happen. You get behind really far early, you lose your mid tower, you're not able to contest mid and play for mid first. And so what you want to then do 
is instead of just sitting mid and letting them shove waves into you and you doing nothing, you use the window where they're shoving mid to look to pressure elsewhere on the map. And so I'm hanging around mid and then this wave, we are not really going to be able to contest and generate pressure through mid. So I'm going to be grouping up with my team and this is the win condition, right? Just group up, roam around, find picks, force number advantages and see if you can get something done. And so we can see their mid laner is on mid wave. And so we have this brief window to look for a fight. Okay. And that's what we do. And it's the concept that's important. Obviously we're down um, 12K <laughs> at 14 minutes. So we might not come out ahead in this situation, but just in terms of macro, if you can't pressure mid, then you're pressuring somewhere else. And so what ends up happening, uh, we get a huge shutdown and you know, this fight, you know, it could go one way or another, maybe, uh, but yeah. Okay, so this is the game where we were as Janna versus Samir and Nautilus and we successfully prevented their snowball. So on paper, the mid to late should be pretty straightforward. Let's just see how that's going to happen. Um, I'm going to be pressuring with my jungler and I'm going to be looking to play through mid first. Okay, so grouping up with my jungler, pressuring with her and then playing around mid. And then there's a bit of an engage over here. I use my Q to slow down the Nautilus. I don't have my ult, so I'm trying to just survive here. There's a big skirmish going on and I'm trying to make the most of my cues. I'm making sure that my cues are landing every time that I am using it. I'm not looking for too creative um, cues. Using my stopwatch to buy cooldown for my next cue. And then I just wanted to show back here, um, I decided to <laughs> just tank the cue for my Diana and then just die for her. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if I should just let her, you know, try and juke and then I juke as well, but that's the decision that I made. So that fight, I just wanted to show that you're just looking to make the most of your cues and skirmishes. So here's a great example of being disciplined and really trying to organize yourself in that front to back fight. So we want to contest this dragon, but we don't really have control of the river. And as an enchanter, it's really awkward to face check bushes. So I'm queuing this bush. I am playing around them, potentially being around here, which they are. And I am trying to, you know, be in a front to back situation so that I have a frontliner that is between myself and the enemy. And in that way, when they engage on my frontliner, then I can safely disengage on them. And then the fight is fantastic. So if I rush this, if I just try to run through here, I might get Nort hooked, I might get Lee uh, queued and then kicked in, something like that. So really disciplined, ensuring that there is a front to back, slowly posturing and waiting for that opportunity um, to, you know, to play off my frontline which is what I want to do. And I have my ult this whole time. So worst case, I'm going to, you know, ult their secondary engage once again. So as always, I'm trying to push around mid first in here. You know, these types of situations can happen and especially in lower elos where people just don't really respect your queue from fog and they're just going to be out of position. And so what happens here is I make sure that I am in fog and then I throw my queue from fog and then we just kind of get a random kill. Um, but it is very important to stay in fog. So let's just go back to Samira's vision. So she she sees a giant just like kind of running towards top river and then she, maybe she feels like she is safe and just trying to one-shot this wave, but she can't see my tornado at all until it's too late. And then she has to waste her W and she just kind of dies. So the main point for this skirmish is stay in fog and fish for cues around mid um, if there is no organized skirmish or team fight. Okay, moving forwards from this pick, we decided to use this pick to try and force a Baron because we have a healthy front line and I can shield them to uh, reduce the amount of damage that they take. And also we want enemies coming into us. That's what Jana, that's the situation that she flourishes, right? So if you start uh, a Baron or a Dragon and you organize yourself in a front to back situation, then you're just in a really good spot. Okay, so this game, I just want to show some, you know, very standard fundamentals for the mid to late in terms of pressuring with jungler and also how Jana can roam to sides quite quickly. And so in this game, I went Swifties. Um, what I should have done is just drop a mid ward and then move. Um, but the way that this early game played out is we lost our mid tower. So it's going to be quite hard to force priority in mid. And so I'm really looking for opportunities to punish uh, side lanes and pressure with my jungler, primarily. And so I see some action going on up here and Camille I deem is just too far overextended. And so I'm going to react to this. I was trying to stay in fog. I'm scared of face checking this bush. If Echo is just standing here because he realizes I'm here, I could get one shot. So I'm being a little bit disciplined here, making sure that I don't just get one shot. 
and then eventually I'm going to move up to this fight, and it's just going to be a pretty straightforward couple of kills here. I just make sure that she stays alive. And this is the mobility of Jana coming into full effect. What I want to show for the rest of this game is just how I play around mid and I pressure with my jungler and I fight in the front to back and I stay disciplined. So what I'm going to do is just put it on eight times. Um, this might be hard to look at, but just pay the most attention to the minimap, okay? So I'm Jana is mid right now and we're playing for mid first and then I use a window after shoving mid to do some vision control and then I'm back mid and then I'm not face checking and I'm waiting for them to use their engage tools on my front line and then once I can position in a front to back then I'll be more happy. So I kind of get jumped on echo a little bit here and this is where you can see that it is really important to have that front to back. So ideally my whole team is mid here and we look to shove mid and then move as a team or we all look to sack mid and then group up. Um, but not having that front to back, I'm really hesitant in like entering this fight. And with good reason, right? Because I just can't really, I can get one shot and I can't really enter the fight. So I just kind of hang on the fringes and then eventually I can group up in the river and then have my front line in front of me. And then we're in a good spot. Okay, moving forwards. Just keep your eye on the minimap once again. Mid first. So this game I really slipped up on warding mid lane. I, I should have been warding mid constantly. And then pressuring with jungler, using my mobility to move to sides. Moving forward, same thing. Playing around mid first, and then these random picks can happen. Just like that Samira clip that we saw earlier, sometimes you're just going to be able to, you know, find a random fight. I have my Shirelias. I can speed us up, Siva can speed us up, I can get a W, and you never know, you know, you can just get like kind of random kills here and there. As long as you're playing around mid first and looking for opportunities to dip into fog, you're in a good spot. So I just want to talk about the examples that I have showed in my um, reviews. I've been winning a lot of 2v2s laning phases that I shouldn't, and I couldn't really find any good examples of fully embracing the roaming identity over the laning identity. I did show myself roaming, uh, you know, post 8 minutes uh, in some examples. And trying to point out windows where if there was a more volatile mid matchup that I would be roaming more often. Something that I want you guys to think about is to be allergic to zero pressure. So if you're winning 2v2, great. Dominate the 2v2. You can play for lane, you don't have to roam. If you're losing 2v2 and you are hanging around bot, you are exerting zero pressure. You, know, you want to develop an allergy to that so that you're always pressuring somewhere. Either you're pressuring bot and you're winning or you're losing bot and you're pressuring through your mid jungle. Also, in terms of mid to late clips, um, the vast majority of Jana games I've been spamming um, over the last month, they've been over very quickly, okay? And maybe this is unlucky, maybe this is just part of the meta. Typically mid to late is more uh, chaotic than the early games too, so I want to encourage you to uh, keep the core principles in mind. Uh, mid, uh, mid first pressure with your jungle vision, front to back fights, you know, deliberate spell usage, and then just get the reps in. There's going to be a lot of skirmishes, a lot of team fights, Feel out what your champ can and can't do uh, in whatever situations may arise. All right, so let's move on to the 1% now. In terms of hitting Jana's Q, you want to be unpredictably unpredictable. You know, mix it up, start wild. Eventually, you want to condition them into running into your Q. You can even channel it from fog like you've seen and then move out of fog and just get a feel of how people react or generally anticipate uh, where your Q to go. So channeling your Q in vision, you don't have to charge it to the max. You can recast it when they're in line with your Q direction uh, and when they're locked into an auto attack. So what you can do is channel it and then maybe they're going to be start to juke backwards and forwards. And then, you know, once they auto a minion or once they are in line with it, then you release it. Like all Trevelyas users, optimize uh, move speed from base with your E. So press an E on an ally so you can both run out faster. And also you want to stay within passive range when leaving base or when disengaging in a fight. So maybe if you and your ADC are slightly off tempo, you can hang around a little bit to make sure that they're in your passive so that they can move faster as well. If you're taking heal, you can heal during R without it canceling. So you can make use of the E passive as well. So what you'd want to do is uh, display someone with your R and then you press heal alongside your ult healing. Another 1% is to just shield tower. Uh, when you know it's going to be taking damage and then the last one percenter since your E decays you want to use it as late as possible on damage instances Otherwise the the main learning that you're going to get from Jana as her fundamentals are quite basic 
you just want to get into a lot of team fights and skirmishes and figure out how to use a queue in lane and how best to stay alive and impact team fights as much as possible. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope that you enjoyed and that you learned something. Jana is just a great champ for your pool for any elo uh, and for many reasons not to mention her diverse playstyle. Please consider uh, liking and subscribing but only if you enjoyed the content and to join my growing support community uh, School of Support. The link is going to be down in the description below um, for educational content, for answers and for coaching. Uh, my Patreon link is going to be down below. Thanks again for watching and goodbye.